Dobrý den. Good morning, good afternoon, Moscow. It's a great pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. I am talking about education and really the justified roles for government in education. You see this table here. I've been trying to fill in this table about roles, justified roles for government in funding, regulation and provision. For the last two decades of my life, I've been thinking hard, trying to fill in that table. And today, I can launch my filled-in table for you. It is as follows. The table filled in. I do not believe there are any justi justified roles for the government in education. This is the argument of today's talk and I will give you two types of evidence from that empty table there. Let's have two types of evidence. And the first focuses on what I call grassroots privatization. The second, I'll briefly mention some historical facts as well. A few weeks ago, I was in the Gulf of Kutch, which is that part of India bordering on Pakistan. I was in a fishing village here, a fishing village called Sika. And I was talking to the fishermen and the fishmonger wives about the government school, the public school in their village. They, were, they said it was terrible. They said what one father told me his child was in fifth grade could only, could only write the number one. That was it. That was all she could do. Another mother complained. She had five children in the government school. She said, the teachers turn up at 8.30. Uh, the, the children go to school at 8.30. The children wait two hours for their teacher to arrive. The teacher then sends them home for breakfast. And then by the time the children come back, they do some chores in the school. And then the school day is finished. But one father said something that I'll never forget. He said to me, I went to complain. I was so fed up with the school, the government school, I went to complain. And you can see what happened. The teachers saw this smelly, dirty, illiterate fisherman coming to the school. And they phoned the police and they had him arrested for abusing the teachers. And he had to raise money from the community in order to get bail. So this poor father was fed up with government schools for his children. He wanted to do something about it. And he, he failed. But I'll never, I'll tell you in a moment the, the end of this story, at the end of the talk. But the good news is, the good news is, across India, across Africa, across Latin America, even in China, there is an alternative to that indifference in the government schools. And the alternative I found for myself um, when I was in Hyderabad, in south central India, I was there, as, as I was indicated, on a mission from the World Bank, or at least the International Finance Corporation, the private arm of the World Bank, and I wanted to see what was happening in the slums of India. And so I went there on one day off to have a look. And very quickly, I found a school, a private school. A private school charging fees, making its earnings from fees only. In those days, charging about the equivalent of one US dollar per month. 40 rubles, I believe, per month. And then I found another. And then another, and another, and soon realized there were many of these low-cost, that's the term I used, low-cost private schools serving the poor in the slums of Hyderabad. I talked to parents. I said, well, why are you sending your children to the private school? You're poor. I said to one poor Muslim mother in a, in a, in a burqa. 
And um, she told me, I, I said, the, the government school, you get free books, you get free lunch, you get free uniform. You have to pay for everything in this school. And she said to me, in the government school, our children are abandoned. And so I went to see one of the government schools. And uh, in the classroom, there, you can't see all the children here. There were 130 children sitting on the floor, all eager young children sitting amongst the mosquitoes, eager to see this visitor to their school. Yes, they were abandoned. There should be nine teachers in this school. Today, the day I visited, there were only two teachers. And every day there are only two teachers. There's a rotor, informal rotor amongst the staff, so they don't have to come to school. So I got really excited about this. I went back to Washington, D.C., to the World Bank, and I told people something extraordinary is going on in the old city of Hyderabad. Something extraordinary is going on amongst the poor. They're going to private schools. These private schools, there seem to be hundreds of them, and the government schools the children are abandoned. And I was told to calm down. I was told, Thule, you've seen just a few businessmen ripping off the poor. You've seen nothing remarkable. So I managed to get some funding from the John Templeton Foundation in the US to explore whether this phenomenon existed elsewhere. And one of the first places I visited was Lagos in Nigeria, and particularly this slum called Makoko, which is a, a shanty town built on stilts in the black waters of the Lagos Lagoon. And when I drove past there, there's a motorway that drives nearby, and people told me it's far too dangerous to go there. You mustn't go there. Um, but it was where I had to go, so I took a canoe, we went in there, and very quickly we found our first private school, Kennedy Private School. And then, you've guessed it, we found another, and another, and another, and another. And in that one slum alone, there were 32 private schools, all serving poor communities, all there because parents didn't want to send their children to the government schools, and again, Kenya. This is the slum called Kibera. It's one of the most famous slums in the world now. There are lots of aid and development work goes on there. Before we started our work, people would say, where does Frank go to school? And people would assume he's in a government school or he's out of school. But what we found was that Frank, if you follow him into the slums there, Frank is going to a private school a private school, one of 100 private schools in that slum alone. And finally, I just want to tell you, there's another one, about China. I, I was talking earlier, people couldn't quite believe there are private schools in China. And I gave a talk in Beijing about the work we'd been doing in Nigeria and India, and I said to people, um, could you get low-cost private schools in China, would they exist? And uh, afterwards, someone who was working for the British government aid agency, the British government aid agency, DFID, he came up to me and said, we work in some of the poorest parts of China, in Gansu province, in the northwest of China. And we work in the poorest villages, and I can tell you categorically, there are no private schools in those villages. So. This was rather like, in English we say, a red rag to this bull. This was rather like an incentive for me to go and look. And as luck would have it, this young man here um, was a student of mine. He was just signing on at the university at the same time. And I asked him where he was from, and he said, I'm from Gansu province. And I said, well, do you mind waiting a few months before you sign on? I want us to go there together to see what we can find. And so we went together to Gansu province. We asked in the villages, we asked of people harvesting like this. We abandoned a vehicle and went on vehicles in the narrowest roads you've seen, in some of the most beautiful mountains you've seen, um, where people were still harvesting as they've done for hundreds of years. 
and uh, through narrow gorges right to the ends of the world. And there at the ends of the world, there was a private school, People's Hearts Private School, where the children sang a beautiful song to me, um, translated, I think, was, Don't Turn Your Eyes Away from These Precious Children. On that first journey, we found pri five private schools like these in the remote mountains. And I came back to the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Lanzhou, which is the capital of Gansu province. And I, I was there to seek permission to do research. And I told, through my translator, what I'd found. I'd visited five private schools in these remote mountains. And the official said to me, the People's Republic of China has universal public education. Universal means for the poor as well as for the rich. Therefore, what you're describing is logically impossible. And so I was thrown into the situation where I was, you know George Orwell's 1984 where the official tells you black is white, I was like, I'd, I'd seen these five schools for myself, and he was telling me they were logically impossible. But fortunately, China works in a way, I don't know whether Russia works like this too, but China works in interesting ways. We, um, we managed to get permission to do research there by taking him out to dinner uh, once, twice, a few banquets, and he gave us permission to do research. And in those mountains, we found 586 low-cost private schools in these remotest mountains on earth. So it's an extraordinary phenomenon. It's, it's all over the place. Now we're continuing our research in South Sudan, Sierra Leone, where these children are stonebreakers. Sierra Leone, the city of Freetown, is built on rock, and the children are employed as stonebreakers to, to break the rocks into smaller pieces. The slums of Monrovia in Liberia. More, more from Sierra Leone, Somaliland. So these are countries now I'm working in, and I'm finding the same kinds of figures all over the place. This table here, um, I don't want you to look at this table. It's just to show you that I've been busy. <laughs> but we've been testing. We've been testing thousands of students in the private schools and in the government schools. And we're creating tables like this and finding standardized results, controlling for background variables, and finding that children in the government schools are doing far worse than the children in the for-profit and non-profit private schools. We're finding that the majority of school children are in these low-cost private schools, in the urban areas. 70, 75% of children are in these low-cost private schools. Children going to government schools are a minority amongst the poor. And we're finding that the schools are outperforming, as I showed you there. But another very interesting bit of data here. This is from Doe Community, which is one of the slums of Monrovia in Liberia. The other slums are called West Point, there's one called Chicken Soup Factory, which you can probably guess why it's called Chicken Soup Factory. And there's one called Red Light. And you may guess incorrectly why that is called Red Light. It's named after the only functioning traffic light in Monrovia. Anyway, we looked at, we did household surveys and we found that children, that the fees at the government schools are a third of the fees at the private schools. So yes, sending your child to a private school seems much more expensive. But then, if you add in all the other costs, transport, uniform, books, and all these sort of things, you find that the other costs, in the middle here, the other costs are roughly similar in the government and the private schools. So if you add them all together, you get the cost of sending a child to a private school is not much more expensive than the cost of sending to a government school if you're poor. In fact, the cost of sending a child to a government school might be 
of, on average, of the cost of sending a child to a private school. So this is something that I've been finding out all over the world, the same phenomenon. Let's summarize so far. The majority of poor children, 75, 70% of poor children are going to private schools in the slums around India and sub-Saharan Africa. These schools are outperforming the government schools. And the cost to parents is not that different from the cost to, to uh, send your child to a government school. But what is the difference there? And, and now we're trying to think about what lessons we might have for, for Russia and for libertarians in general. What, 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 what is the difference in these schools? Well, we'd made a film in this fishing village called Bocciano, 40 minutes from Accra in Ghana. We made a film for PBS um, called The Ultimate Resource. It's a film made by the Free to Choose organization. You can see it on, uh, on YouTube. We followed Victoria. Uh, we followed Victoria through her schooling. And again, before we started our work, people would assume Victoria is in a government school or Victoria is out of school. She's a fisherman's daughter. But we followed her into her school, and she's, you've guessed it, she's going to a private school, Supreme Academy. In these days, maybe charging about five US dollars per month, now about 200 rubles per month. And we went out on the fishing boat with her father, getting up at three in the morning, going out into the into, into, the, into the ocean. And we talked to the father, why was he sending, his, the name is Joshua, why was he sending his child to private school? And he, he said this, this very pithy explanation, he said the reason why the private schools are better than the government schools is because there is a private owner. If you don't teach as expected, you'll be fired and replaced. And that was his experience, I guess, of the fishing boat. That when he's on his fishing boat, he knows if someone doesn't turn up in the morning, they are, they're, they're threatened in their work, so they have to turn up, they have to work. And he recognizes the difference with crystal clarity between the government schools and the private schools in his own village. In his own village, he recognizes the difference. I made another film with the BBC this time. And it was in those, those, that slum I showed you at the beginning in Makoko, in Nigeria, in Lagos. And we'd spent some time with the BBC in the private schools and seen energetic teaching and energetic learning going on. And then we managed to get permission from the government to go and visit the government school, which is on the outskirts of the slum. They knew we were coming. They, we, we were accompanied by the Deputy Minister of Education. And yet the very first classroom, this is in the government school, the very first classroom we entered, the teacher was fast asleep at his desk. And the children were teaching themselves. And I, I wouldn't have shown this on the BBC. Um, and perhaps I wouldn't have been so unkind as to have the voiceover of the Minister of Education saying, in the past, our teachers, we had problems with our teachers, but now our teachers are well-trained and well-disciplined. I, I wouldn't have done that if this is not something you see all the time when you go to the government schools. Teachers sleeping, teachers absent, teachers not teaching as they should. So this is something I've been celebrating ever since doing this research. The numbers are huge. There might be 300,000 or more of these low-cost private schools across India. Maybe 80 to 100,000 of these low-cost private schools across Anglophone West Africa. Um, so it's something I've been celebrating. I wrote a book about this, The, the Beautiful Tree, um, which is published by Penguin. You can certainly get it on Amazon. I have one copy with me, which I I'm happy to give away perhaps to the person whose question I like the best. And for Finnish readers, you can um, have the beautiful tree in Finnish. 
Anyone speak Finnish here? Anyone read Finnish? Okay, well, I'll, I'll take this back with me then. I know there's at least one Finnish reader here. I, I met her earlier. Good. So it's been translated into many languages. Okay, so I want to move now just slowly towards what's the relevance for us. But I want to talk about some of the things we're doing in different parts of the world which are, are recognizing these private schools exist, recognizing they're better than the government schools, but perhaps thinking they can still be improved. And because they're in the private sector, they're in a genuine market in education, they can be easily improved, or much more easily improved than the public schools. So I want to tell you about a few things, but one of the things we've been doing is working with existing Ghanaian, in this case Ghana, Ghanaian entrepreneurs to create chains of private schools. The idea is that if you are a standalone school, okay, you're doing better than the government school, your teachers turn up, they're not fast asleep in the classroom, but you can't afford to develop curriculum, teacher training, you can't afford to innovate as a single school. But if you've got a chain of schools of 100, 200, 300, 1,000 of these schools, then you get a little margin from each school which can become a big sum of money if it's a company. So you can in, uh, invest in research and development to improve what you're doing. So I've created with Ken Donko here Omega Schools in Ghana. And we've grown from... Um, we've grown from... Zero, it, we started in 2009, our first school. In four years, in four years, we grew to 20,000 students and 40 schools. This year, we are consolidating our position, and, but next year, we'll grow to 100, and then maybe 300 uh, in, in, in two years' time. And the idea being that we think we can standardize, we can standardize what goes on in the school so that we can quickly replicate it in other schools with appropriate training, with appropriate investment, and so we can deliver what independent research is showing is a better quality of education at a very, very low price. We charge in these schools a very interesting method of charging. We have an all-inclusive daily fee uh, because the cash flow of the poor is daily, and so the idea is that it's very hard if you're poor to save term fees. And it's very hard then to save for uniforms and so on. So we, we, we have the costs all over the year. We amortize them over the year. And then children pay daily. And they, they pay about, um, what is it? It's about 50 cents. So that's about 20 rubles per day. That includes lunch, books, uniform, everything. That's all-inclusive fee. And these schools are very, very popular amongst the poor communities that are using them. So that's, that's one way of doing it. And th there are other chains of schools. I'd like to talk to you about chains if it comes up in the, the questions. There are chains of schools being created across um, other parts of Africa. There are chains in India which are seeing if they can create a standardized model of education for low-income families, which is better than any alternative and which can expand very quickly. But I've also been working in federations of these schools. There's a federation here in Nigeria called AFED, which is a wonderfully Nigerian name. It's the Association of Formidable Education Development. It's a very uh, characteristic Nigerian name. And we have 3,000 schools as part of our federation, doing great work there in those slums, including those slums in the, that I showed you earlier. And in, in case you can't see me in the, in the photograph here, I'm the one in the middle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then we've been working in India, in Punjab. Now, in Punjab, they have this characteristic saber that is therefore that, that they're allowed to carry as part of the, the Sikh religion. But 
The government is closing down these private schools in Punjab. Thousands of these private schools have been closed. And so we are working to fight the closure of these schools um, with the association there. So that's this story of what's happening all over the world, all over the developing world. Government is not needed to provide education, and it's not needed to provide education for the poorest, and in fact, the poorest do better going outside of the government system. But just very briefly, I want to mention historical features, just very brief briefly, because people like the Nobel Prize winner Amartya Sen, in the quote just earlier, he says that historically countries like England, like America, like Russia, countries that have universal education, they needed government to get going. And without government, we wouldn't have education as we know it. Historically, that is simply not true. And I really recommend to you to read a book by Professor Edwin George West, E.G. West. In 1965, he wrote a book called Education and the State. So 50 years ago next year, this seminal work came out, which was re-looking at the history of education in 19th century England and Wales, and also 19th century New York, Massachusetts in America, and also New South Wales in, in Australia. And uh, this book is, uh, yeah, 50 years next year, this came out. And he showed, amongst other things, I won't go into any details here, but he showed, amongst other things, that before the state got involved in England, there were reports, government reports, like the 1861 Newcastle Commission, which showed that the vast majority of children were in school for an average of 5.7 years. The vast majority of children, 95% of children, were in school for 5.7 years. This was before the state got involved in 1870, or well, there were some small subsidies since 1833. But basically, this was almost universal provision through government, uh, through private initiative, and the schools were of three types. They were church schools, they were philanthropic schools, but they were also this very much a maligned dame school. They were called dame, as in a, an old lady, dame schools. And those dame schools were in fact the, the same as the low-cost private schools I've been describing around the world today. And in fact, the reason why I went looking for low-cost private schools in the slums of India was because I had read the history of Victorian England, 19th century England, and realized the private sector could well be serving the poor. Okay, so let me just um, conclude the last two minutes now. Just the title of my talk, I, I should have introduced at the beginning, but it was Education, the Last Frontier for Libertarians. Because when, when you think about liberty as libertarians in Russia, I'm sure you think of America and places like that as being somehow beacons, or at least in some sense, beacons of liberty. Perhaps you compare yourselves unfavorably. But in terms of education, America is, is no way advanced in terms of liberty. They, people in America talk endlessly. If, they, if you've ever had American visitors come and talk about education, they talk about things called vouchers. You've heard of vouchers. I know I've been talking to some of you, and you've said, yes, there are these things called vouchers, and they are the way in which government first of all, takes your money in taxes, but then returns it to you and you can take it to any school you want. And Milton Friedman had this idea of vouchers in 1955. He wrote a seminal paper, The Role of Government in Education. And I, I call vouchers 
It's a, the supplicant model. It's where, as I say, government takes your money and then gives some of it back to you. But the key thing about vouchers is they've been totally unsuccessful in America. These are some, I've just published these figures here. And they show, there's a, a line there, voucher programs. They show that the percentage of American school children, five to 17 years old, the percentage of American school children using any form of vouchers is 0.2%. So this brave reform that Milton Friedman came out with in 1955 is, it's a failure. It's not working. No state has adopted it on a universal level, but possibly Indiana, but you know, there's always one possibility of a state that's doing it and then it always fails. Uh, the, the, the percentages are, are tiny. And even when you add in things like charter schools, when you add in things like uh, tax credits, you still get less than 5% of American children have this form of freedom. But when you compare it even with private education as exists in America, you've got 14%, the bottom line there, 14% of children are in this, if you like, spontaneous order of education outside of the state. So it's three, oh, three times more successful than the, the school choice reforms, like vouchers, tax credits, and charter schools. So I suggest that when libertarians think about education, they don't think about education reform. You shouldn't think about trying to reform government and try and get it to give you things like vouchers, tax credits, and charter schools. I believe that you should learn from what's happening in India, Africa, Brazil, countries like that, and suggest that, you, you know the Nike phrase, just do it. The Nike advertisement, just do it. Just do this grassroots privatization, irrespective of what government says. In that way, I think you're going to see education brands as big as came in that first wave of globalization, the McDonald's and the Starbucks. I believe you're going to see education brands emerging in India, China, possibly even Brazil, that will come and show how you can do innovative, quality education at a very low price that can really transform, transform education across the world. OK. That's my book, The Beautiful Tree. You can read all about it. Um, perhaps, oh, it would be wonderful if it's translated into Russian one day. That's a sort of a little hope I have here. Thank you for listening. Спасибо огромное, Джеймс. Те, кто могут задавать вопросы по-английски, пожалуйста, задавайте их по-английски. Я бы начал вот с, с такого немножко, немножко странного вопроса. Джеймс, вы говорите о частной и государственной системах, системах образования как о такой, ну как бы, как, как, как о двух, в принципе, конкурирующих системах. Однако во многих странах, в том числе и в России последних лет, Государство по, по мере того, как оно как бы идет к тем или иным авторитарным формам правления, к авторитарному политическому режиму, оно начинает использовать образование как институт, транслирующий идеологию, как способ внедрить в сознание детей определенные идеи, определенную сумму, определенную концепцию идей и именно а, но им, именно в этом в этом качестве образование для государства является ценностью то есть государство готово платить очень много платить и еще чуть-чуть доплачивать за эту возможность идеологического влияния за возможность идеологической промывки мозгов а, 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 значит детей 
Как в этих условиях, с вашей точки зрения, может развиваться частное образование? Какие островки и зоны ему остаются в таких странах, в странах с авторитарными, недемократическими политическими режимами? Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's very interesting about the situation in Russia, which I, obviously I'm, I'm coming in learning very slowly, but nonetheless interested in how this fits in here. Um, but what you've described uh, as governments wanting education for social control, for all authoritarian ideological purposes, what I can say to you is join the club. The reason why government got involved in education in the United States of America back in the 19th century was precisely social control. In that case, it was because it wanted to wipe out or get rid of the Catholics. The Protestants were in the ascendance and governments wanted schools to be all instruments of social control. In England, well, It may have been more subtle, it may have been more subtle, but there are inspectors' reports from the 1850s, for example, when they were trying to work out whether government should be involved in education, and inspectors' report, reports from the 1850s and earlier were saying, we don't like this private education because it allows ordinary working people to rise above their station. This, this is a phrase we use in English. Um, do you understand? It means to, to, um, to, be, to think they're better than they are. You know, they're literate, they're numerate. Soon they'll be questioning the aristocracy, the state, and so on. And uh, so, so, in a sense, this is not a new phenomenon. This is not a new phenomenon. And in the countries I'm working in, again, I showed you in the Punjab, in India, The private schools are wanting to be closed. Why do they want to, to close them? Maybe one of the reasons is because they allow children, that the government is not in control of that important part of a children's upbringing. But that's why, you see, uh, thank you for asking this question, because in a way, that's why education is so important to libertarians. It must be important to us because in the end, we have to stand firm and say, we don't want government controlling children's minds. We don't want government brainwashing children, as you said. And so this struggle to get private education, to get some semblance of control, is a very important one. And so what I would say in a country like Russia, which maybe is going through this phase here, maybe you've just got to keep that flame alive of private education. You've got to keep that impetus alive of what independent, free education can be so that in happier times, you can expand more readily. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's working. Um, two questions, please. Uh, one, uh, had you studied, uh, compared, uh, compare, had you compared the situation uh, b between the very poor communities, which were all the examples, and some probably neighboring more, more affluent com communities, middle uh, class in the same countries? And the second question, are capacities of the government systems enough to service all these poorest communities? If private schools you described disappeared, will they be able to serve all the existing children in the government system? Thank you. Yeah, th th thank you. So it depends, uh, the second question first on government capacity, it depends on the country, but typically, so in the Indian example, in the Indian poor areas, there are government schools available. And these government schools are becoming increasingly empty. I can take you to one government school in a poor part of Hyderabad where there are 17 teachers and 15 children because the children have all left. 
and gone to these private schools. So that, in that sort of case, there's definitely capacity. In other places, you'll, you'll, you'll think, okay, if, the, if these schools are closed, the children won't be able to go anywhere because the government schools are free or unavailable. So it really varies, but my guess is overall, if you wanted a global picture, then the, there, there would not be enough government places to go around for these children. Because remember, a lot of these children are in illegal or gray area schools, un, unregistered schools. In terms of the official statistics, they are the children who are supposedly out of school. A lot of these countries have huge problems of out of school children. Those children are not, by and large, out of school. They are in unregistered, illegal, private schools. So, if, 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 so it's the problem of getting out of school children into schools actually would be the same if these schools were closed. O on the first question, comparing uh, private schools in more affluent and, and low-income low areas, is that what you were suggesting? Yes. Yes, uh, so we, we've done, yeah, we have done some citywide surveys like this, and we find that the, that the, so in terms of achievement, as you'd expect, achievement is better in the more affluent areas than in the poor areas, in, on average, in general. Um, but the, the, what you find almost universal is the percentage of parents who prefer private education. It's always there up in the 90%, something like that, in the affluent areas and in the poor areas. There's no difference now. This is a phenomenon in the countries I'm describing which unites people across the income ranges. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Alexey Yevsenko. I'm a member of the Libertarian Party. And I have a very brief question. Uh, have you noticed any difference in the curriculum? Because in this, uh, with the public schools, Obviously, the government dictates the curriculum, the subjects uh, the, uh, the, the kids are going to study uh, and all that. And is there any difference in the, pub, uh, in, in the private schools? Is there a demand for some other subjects, for something else? Yes. And, and this then reflects on the question, the first question, um, when you're thinking about what could free schools look like, schools for freedom uh, in Russia and other author authoritarian countries. Typically in these countries, there is an authoritarian national curriculum and national assessment system. And if you're a poor parent, then obviously, or is it obvious, it's, it's the case anyway, that poor parents want their children to go through that national system. They see it as the, the only, only show in town, as it were, and so they have to do it. But the, typically, the national curriculum is very leisurely, is very slow. And, for example, the computer curriculum takes, takes I think, four weeks to teach you how to, uh, oh, sorry, two weeks to teach you how to single click on a mouse, and then a further two weeks to teach you how to double click on the mouse. You know, it's very, very leisurely. So one of the first things I did with the Omega schools, that chain of schools in Ghana, was I got our computer expert we have a head office which devises the curriculum. I said, this is a nine-year curriculum here. I want you to get it into one year if you can. You know, let's, we'll, we'll jump through the government hoop, but let's condense it as, 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 as short as we can so we can free up time for other things. And we can free up time for entrepreneurship, business studies, economics. Um, and, uh, and more English. English is so important in all these countries I work in. And yet the government schools, they, they have a little bit of English. We want lots of English. So th the curriculum, yes, it, legally it has to be the same, but there are ways around making it different, more imaginative, more interesting, and more relevant. Thank you very much. Мы немножечко все больше и больше выбиваемся из графика, но организаторы говорят, что ничего в этом страшного нет. Пожертвуем обедом, в крайнем случае. Это была шутка. There's lots of very hungry people here, it looks like. Из беднейших районов. Вопрос. Юрий Жуковский, писатель. Скажите, пожалуйста, а существуют ли официально зарегистрированные, имеющие официальные лицензии частные школы в Китае? 
Или все они без исключения находятся в серой, в серой зоне? Когда вам государственные чиновники Китая говорят, что частных школ в Китае нет, возможно, их легально действительно нет. И еще один вопрос. Имеют ли выпускники частных школ Китая какую-то дискриминацию при поступлении в престижные вузы относительно выпускников государственных школ? Или они равноправны? Yes. So, so you're referring when I was in China and we talked to the official and they said there were, there were no private schools there. And when we were visiting the local offices, there was a map on the wall. And obviously I, didn't, I don't know Chinese, so I didn't know what the code meant. But my student said to me that actually this particular code means private school and there were three or four private schools on the map. So, They are, they are, are they licensed? Are they licensed? Is that the question? <laughs> no speak Russian. Is it, is it the question, are they licensed? Yeah, so that's what I was, I'm just about, I was, I was going in a long way to say it's, it's a gray area. At the local level, they seem to be known by the authorities and seem to, people seem to accept there are two types. There's a minban and a sili. Minban is a non-profit, sili is a proprietor school. As you move higher up in the, um, in the Chinese system, they seem, to, they seem to suggest these are not wholly legal. But there are international private schools which are legal and licensed. Okay, so there are, there's an elite private school which is a license. These ones at the lower level, I got the sense that they were locally known, but nationally not known and not recognized. That's my, but it's a gray area. Пожалуйста, короткие вопросы и без доспрашивания. Один, один uh, hello человек, everyone. один вопрос. Uh, thanks you, thank you, James. Uh, uh, I will ask you in Russian because uh, it seems to me... Um, quite difficult to uh, specify my question in English as I want. So, um, как вы думаете, создание uh, такого широкого института частных школ в развивающихся странах да, uh, не создаст ли среды для uh, развития и свежих ростков uh, разного рода экстремистских идей, экстремистских течениях, и такие э, прецеденты уже были в разных странах, и в особенности это касается стран э, с э, большинством мусульманского населения из числа развивающихся, где, усло, э, где э, угроза исламского радикализма особенно стоит остро, и если такие варианты и угрозы вами рассматривались, то э, какие меры вами предусмотрены для их пресечения? Спасибо. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound facetious, I don't want to sound <laughs> facetious, but I have good news for you. The vast majority of parents, whether they're Muslims, Hindus, Christians, or whatever, or, or non-believers, don't want their children to blow themselves up um, for the sake of any, any, any ideology. The, the vast majority. There's been some work done on this as it happens. The, the Muslim extremist schools that people are worried about are called madrasas. And people assume madrasas are prevalent and nasty. Now, a lot of the work that, uh, a lot of the schools that are supposedly seen by outsiders as madrasas in Pakistan and Muslim parts of India are actually the low-cost private schools that I described, which are run by Muslims. So they might start with Muslim prayers as a Christian school starts with Christian schools, but that's the end of the Islamic influence. But there's, there's a, I forget the name of the book, but a very interesting book looking at the origin of terrorists who have blown themselves up around the world. And yes, they can be identified with two or three madrasas, primarily in Indonesia. And So that's one way you can identify them, and typically they have gone through government schooling systems otherwise. In other words, they are not people who've come through this sort of system. 
the, the, the basic answer is the vast majority of people do, do not want, want their children to progress. They do not want them to be radicalized and they want them to progress as good human beings. And therefore, this is not an issue that need worry libertarians at least that need not worry about what will happen in, in, in schools in general. One or two rogue schools may emerge and it will literally, literally be two or three in the world. They can be dealt with in different ways. You don't need a general blanket um, forbidding of these schools. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your lecture. And my question is, uh, you mentioned that, uh, uh, do you think that uh, the fact that uh, the poorer people, uh, you mentioned the 75%, are especially concerned about their children not being abandoned in, uh, in the schools, uh, this fact is connected with uh, their, uh, well, uh, that they want their children, they. Th they do not want the education for the children to be formal, that they really feel the education is the only opportunity for their children to join a higher uh, social uh, group uh, to rise socially. Uh, and at the same time, uh, people f uh, who are richer, they, they don't really care about this, this because their children are already in... Uh, they are already... already uh, socially uh, successful, I mean. Yeah. Um, I hope I'm clear. So, sorry, just, just, just clarify. So are you saying, uh, the, the question was about the, 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 the poor, those who are not in private schools, why, is that the why, why do you think uh, the poor uh, are more concerned about their children not being abandoned in the schools? Oh, yeah. But I, I think the answer I gave to a question earlier, I don't think the poor are more concerned. I, mean, I think the poor are as equally as concerned as, as uh, wealthier parents. Um, because, but oh, I, see, I, I, I see where you're, where you're coming from. Obviously, if you're poor, then getting your children a schooling is of huge importance, um, whereas as you say, for, for a richer person, the schooling, you've got already got an environment of contacts and networks and human capital development in the family and, and outside. I, I see what you're, you're getting at. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't quantified this. All I know is that the data shows the poor are exceedingly concerned with getting their children to private schools. The vast majority of those who are in government schools or out of schools would like to get their children to private schools. And this is the issue. Some can't afford them. So we, we try and create scholarship schemes for those children, the poorest of the poorest, who can't get their children to the private schools. So there is a need for scholarship and philanthropy. But, but yeah, I haven't quantified it. Good question, though. К сожалению, последние два вопроса, иначе мы все-таки потеряем сначала Диму Бутылина, а потом обед. А, пожалуйста. Hi. Hello. Hi. First of all, thank you for coming to Russia. And you can see how many questions you have, which yeah. means that it's really, we really appreciate you coming and hopefully it's not too cold for you. <laughs> um, I'm working within higher education e-learning technology right now, and I'm having like humble, curious question. If you've seen any computers or gadgets in the, um, these poor schools, and do kids know about internet? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, th th thank you for welcoming me here. Um, I, I actually, just uh, before that, some of the countries you, I, I work in are, are very similar in many ways to Russia, but, but not in terms of the cold. <laughs> exactly. Um, yes, yeah, so, so in India, so this is now very, very specific to countries. India is more te technologically advanced than, than, say, parts of Africa I'm working in. And typically in the urban schools, you will now see a phenomenon called the techno school, where a private school, a low-cost private school, has introduced some computer lab, but some form of um, you know, uh, multimedia learning, smart board, maybe in one or two classrooms and so on. And these spread like wildfire. You know, once one school is doing it, the parents see that as beneficial. Competition ensures that what, there was one techno school in that street now, there are five techno schools. You see competition working. But 
I'm not convinced necessarily that these are beneficial in the long term, what's happening. But I am working with, have you heard of Sugata Mitra? Um, his work on the hole in the wall and the self-organized learning environments. He's also from Newcastle University, so Google him, Sugata Mitra, M-I-T-R-A, Mitra. He's an Indian, but now works in, in uh, he, he won the uh, million dollar TED Prize uh, last year. Um, so he's, he's very well known. But he's working on children learning through computers in self-organized ways, peer learning, with what he calls the granny cloud, which is someone coming in perhaps from Skype from another country to assist in that learning. So it's very interesting. We're seeing how this can expand in private schools too. We're, people are looking at tablets and so on, but the problem in Africa, it, obviously connectivity is one, but electricity is a problem. You know, where I work in Sierra Leone and Liberia, there's, the electricity is not often available. You know? So you, it's more difficult than you think. But in India, there's definitely progress made there. Yeah. The last question. All right, good afternoon. First of all, thank you for sharing your knowledge and this great experience. And we would greatly appreciate if you can just say at least a few words about investing resources. So if you have any investor, I don't know, conglomeration who on the regular basis help this chain of private schools and where, or probably how, is it possible to find them? Thank you a lot. Okay. So, so the, the general answer is the chains of schools that we're developing. So Omega schools in Ghana, there's a company called Bridge International in Kenya, and one I'm working called Cadmus in India. It, it is genuine investment. It's not, it's not grants or donations in general that you're looking for. Although we had grants in the beginning to help us get going and do some of the market research. So I, I've had grants from the UBS Optimus Foundation in Switzerland, a key organization. UBS is the, the big bank in, in Zurich, UBS Optimus Foundation. But then the investment has come from, um, for Omega, it's come from Pearson. Pearson is the owner of the Financial Times, the biggest education company in the world. They've created the Pearson Affordable Learning Fund which has, um, which has uh, invested in companies like Omega Schools at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, so th you know, there are people who are interested in this. I can give you a fuller list of, uh, of names uh, afterwards if you, if you email me, okay? Good. Спасибо огромное. Спасибо, спасибо. Спасибо.